The following podcast may contain adult language and conversations revolving around situations not suitable for immature audiences. Spoilers and general political incorrectness can often be expected, so listener discretion is advised. They must be destroyed on sight! All right, we're back. Episode 88 of They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. I'm your host, Lee Russell, with my co-host, Daniel Harper. How are you doing, sir? I'm awake this time, so we're doing better than last week, which uh, didn't happen. My fault. It, Sorry. Uh, oh, well. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's the reality of, like, Lee works nights, and I work during the day, and we record Friday nights. And so sometimes I just can't manage to stay up late enough to be functional on this podcast. And, uh... Yeah, I completely blame capitalism for this. And speaking of capitalism, that's the reason we're never going to have Blue Apron be our sponsor. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. They, they just can't rely on us. I mean, you know, we can't send we can't send meals that you can make it your, yourself at home to these guys. <laughs> or Squarespace. Yeah, you know, sorry, I'm yes. I'm I'm a little out of the commercial podcast listening game. So you audiotrial.com know. or wherever the fuck it is. Audible, Audible, Audible dot com, yeah, not, which is actually a pretty fine service. I was I was a subscriber for a while. It's it's really not not a bad way to get audiobooks if you're going to do it. But I don't want to pimp for them in every episode, so you know. Yeah, <laughs> I I just oh man, I'm just getting so sick of hearing podcasts where halfway through their podcast, all of a sudden they try to segue as if it's part of the natural conversation. By the way, you know, it's Valentine's Day. Love is in the air. You should get some Sherry's Berries for your for your uh, loved one. Yeah, great. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't insult my intelligence. Just put your commercials up front or in behind or in the middle and make it apparent they're actually commercials. Right. So we're back. We're going to be doing some more crime films in this extended series on crime films. And we got two more Policioteskis. One of them just vaguely fits into the Policioteski, but everyone sort of jams it into that genre anyway, because uh, both these films were directed by the same director. So we'll be getting into those pretty quick here. Violent City and Revolver. Before we do that, we do have a couple comments to go through. I want to see what Daniel's reaction to this one is, because he speculated that this person doesn't necessarily listen to our podcasts. Uh, this is from our friend C.B. Fall, and he left on the YouTube version of The Big Racket. Really interesting episode. Haven't seen too many Timothy Dalton movies, except for the two James Bond movies and the Doctor Who Christmas special, The End of Time, Parts 1 and 2. Understand why none of you like this movie. Sounds awful to me. Yeah, that's... Uh... That doesn't describe the content of our podcast at all. Did we mention Timothy Dalton at any point during that episode? I don't no, remember it's, it. It's because the picture I used of Fabio Testi kind of looks like Timothy Dalton. Oh I think. well, yeah. I think we I think so, we caught you see me fall. We we appreciate the comments every but, week, but I think but, we caught but in, you. But in the past, I think I've kind of gotten to the. I was I was kind of of the opinion that he probably was listening. But now, you know, no, that doesn't that doesn't sound like he's listening at all. So maybe he's watching the images on the YouTube and has enough context to be able to put together something that's vaguely coherent. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. he still takes the time every week to do it, so I appreciate it. So, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, it's it's kind of it's kind of an amusing <laughs> thing that we do at the beginning of every episode. Is you know, <laughs> what did CB Fall have to say that was yeah. incoherent this week? So you know, thank you, CB Fall. It's it's a uh, um, if you ever stop, then uh, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. So thank yeah. you. But he might actually be a Doctor Who fan, though. I mean, he does know that Timothy Dalton was in some Doctor Who episodes, so... Yeah, maybe maybe he's just uh, here because we haven't put on an early spaceman in a while, and he's, uh, you know, kind of chomping at the bit. <laughs> you know, it's possible. Yeah. And then we have one from my friend Jamie, uh, who goes by Basement Beer Reviews on YouTube, in relation to you uh, saying you uh, briefly worked at NASA. He said, I'd like to hear that story if it hasn't been told before. It's not a um, hugely complicated story. I uh, lived in Huntsville, Alabama for 10 years, and the U.S. Space and Rocket Center is there. Marshall Space Flight Center is there. Red Star Arsenal. Um, it's kind of the only reason that Huntsville, Alabama is a city is as a like, defense contractor. <laughs> um, and NASA, it kind of gets like shunted off to the side of that. Yeah, I had a buddy who worked as a computer operator at the NASA Data Center and supported the shuttle program back in the mid-2000s, and um, he kind of helped me get on there. 
And so I worked there for a little while. I was a data tape operator. I was a computer operator. I, my job was um, basically moving data tapes, um, magnetic real data tapes. Oh, yeah. Um, from one place to another, <laughs> like putting them in, putting them in the vault and pulling the old ones out. And I mean, it, it was very unglamorous work, but, um, you know, pretty easy job. And, um, you know, I get paid pretty well for it. So no, no, not, not too many complaints on that. And uh, I get to say I worked at NASA for a while. So, so this, you know, this, this but technically, the- technically I was a subcontractor. I did not actually work. I wasn't a civil servant. So there are two classes of people that work for like, you know, that sort of organization. You're either a civil servant, in which case you actually work for the government mm-hmm. or you're a subcontractor and you work for a company that's leeching off the teeth of the government. So ah. it's one or the other. I was the other. So technically I did not actually work for NASA, but I worked in support of NASA projects on a NASA facility for one of two subcontractors. So, yeah. Uh, but come on, Daniel, let us know. Let, 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 let's break this story once and for all. Did Stanley Kubrick fake the moon landing for us? No, but it <laughs> does turn out that The Shining was 100% real. Oh, that was, well, fuck. Uh, you know, that's the real conspiracy is that, you know, you the false flag is the whole bit about Kubrick faking the moon landing. The reality is that um, The Shining was real, and the whole like Kubrick moon landing thing was like it's a distraction from that. So okay, well now now people have to start going after Stephen King about writing that goddamn book. Right, right. I mean, it turns out it turns out that uh, <laughs> I'm not even okay. <laughs> let's let's just move on. Um, I, I don't I don't have enough. Uh, I didn't work up this material. I, I probably could uh, could could go for some time if if I had a chance to prep for this, but I did not. So welcome the evening at the improv. I tell yeah. you, yeah. There we go. <laughs> but I'm ting. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Thank you guys for the comments. We can move on now to what we've watched in the last little while, and I'll let you go first, sir, Daniel. Actually, a little bit of uh, personal news, and uh, I know I've mentioned on um, uh, several, on, on quite a few occasions here about my love of the local Alamo Draft House, mm-hmm. which is uh, closing in Kalamazoo oh, really? at the beginning of April for reasons involving their management company, or uh, I mean, the management company of the like theater of the actual like physical theater, like the land management okay. company. It's kind of unclear exactly what's going on. They're kind of like playing some hush hush games about like I mean, we've kind of heard conflicting reports, but the local Alamo is closing, which fucking sucks. Yeah. And basically sucks. means I'm not going to be spending any money at the movies <laughs> after about April third. That said, I did get to see one of a film that we covered um a while back that is one of my favorite episodes we ever did, and they, they did air the big sleep on um, Oh nice. So yeah. I got to go see that. Rewatching it again after we recorded, I just realized that there's even more plot I didn't get to in that synopsis. Like, you know, big chunks of it. It's amazing. Like, watching it without the kind of benefit of like being able to stop and start and just kind of, you know, mm-hmm. because I mean, that's just kind of how we consume movies now. You know, if you're at home, you just kind of, okay, get up and get a snack, you come back, you kind of go away, go to the bathroom, whatever. But like, actually kind of sitting and just like watching it straight through, the thing that kind of comes out at me is just how much of the film is just. Bogart talking to white dudes, you know, like there is just a <laughs> lot of conversation back and forth about various plot mechanics that ultimately don't matter as much as, you know, that the film seems to think they do. Um, but you don't really think about that after you think about like the, I mean, it's written well enough that you kind of get the snappy dialogue and Hawks directs mm-hmm. the fuck out of it. So, I mean, it, it's very, it's well done. And then of course you just kind of remember Bogart being awesome and then Bacall being Bacall. So, yeah. you know, that, that's kind of where you, where you land on it. Yeah, no, I got to see it on the big screen and that was, uh, it won't be the last movie I see there, but it was definitely uh, nice to get to see that before uh, the Alamo goes away. So um, that's, that was a, uh, great experience. The other film I watched just because um, my wife has been watching, um, I've discussed my wife's love for trashy TV on Netflix, just watching mm-hmm. seasons and seasons of shitty TV. She's been watching NCIS, um, oh, yeah. which stars Mark Harmon. And uh, my cultural memory for Mark Harmon is none other than the <laughs> the uh, classic 1987 comedy Summer School, yeah. Christy Alley and Courtney Thorne Smith, and a bunch of other people. And so um, I tracked that down, and we watched that, just kind of like date night at home sort of thing. And uh, wow, that movie holds up a lot better than like you might think it does. Um, oh, yeah. If you haven't seen that in in 20 years, uh, it's not a great film. Um, I never realized it was directed by Carl Reiner. Among other okay. things, yeah, it's like I mean, 
he's actually in the film. He's because the the film basically, if you haven't seen it, and if you haven't, what are you doing listening to the show, right? <laughs> like you know, I can't. I don't know. It was one of those films I grew up with. I watched a bunch because I had it on VHS, um, like recorded off of HBO or something. It's uh, one of those films that I just kind of remember as being just kind of oh dumb, silly comedy, right. and it is, but. There's there's a real warmth to it, and there's a real kind of edge to it at, at times as well. Um, but um, the, the film basically, you know, there's a um, there's these bunch of kids who need to go to remedial English, and um, <laughs> they have to uh, take summer school. But the guy who's going to teach summer school, who is actually played by Carl Reiner, wins fifty thousand dollars in the in scratch off tickets. Um, right, and runs out of um, runs away and never going to see me again. I made fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. You're never seeing me again. I'm set for life, you know, um, which I believe that in public school, that a public school teacher of $50,000 would, would feel that way. Um, obviously not a math teacher or an economics teacher, just no. a, uh, an English teacher. And then uh, good old Mark Harmon playing the uh, lovable goofball uh, has to, is the gym teacher, and he gets to come on and uh, uh, teach the kids English. It's, it goes down smooth. It's pretty painless. It's, it's got its clever moments. I have a, a real warmth to the film. My favorite element is definitely uh, the, two, the two guys who are the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre freaks. Right, right. Um, the Warhounds. And um, I remember that element of the film. I forgot how prominent it is in the film and how good some of the gore is. I mean, there's, there's mm-hmm. some really... I now remember being a kid and watching because I didn't really watch gore movies as a kid. But I remember seeing these effects in this film. And they really... I mean, they, a lot of it does hold up, even though it's in this kind of like goofy comedy kind of context, you know? Right. Yeah. That's totally worth checking out. If you're, if you're kind of like, Oh yeah, I uh, remember vaguely seeing that. I mean, it was a really nice sit with a beer and snuggle with my wife and watch a movie that I watched 20 years ago. You know? Kind of yeah. Thing, so. I, I remember seeing that on uh, TBS all the time and suspecting yeah. that there must have been like nudity cut out of it. Then I rented There's it not. and was totally disappointed. <laughs> yeah, no, there was no nudity in it. Although Courtney Thorne Smith is pretty, is pretty adorable in it. I mean, that was, that's very early in her, uh, before Melrose Place, obviously. And also, and, what's uh, her name there? Uh, Fabinia. Oh, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, no, Christy Allen uh, looks good too, but uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the Italian girl, um, yeah, who's, who's who was in later in Austin Powers, yes, playing a lot of vagina, a lot, a lot of vagina, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm Babid. gonna look it up real quick. I'm gonna look it up real quick so we can um, it's get her name. Babadina Udindo or something. She's also in. Uh, like she's also in uh, Reanimator Part Two, I believe, as well. Nice Bride of Reanimator. Yeah, no. She's actually I one of the I'm, I'm glad you brought her up because uh, yeah it's Fabiana Udin, Udina Ud, Udinio something like that. Well, yeah. I'm glad we're not talking about Italian films today because neither no. one is no shit. Um, <laughs> no, um, she's really fun in it. What I love and what I've not really remembered was how much she really does like these kind of goofball gore guys, you know. And she really kind of I mean she really kind of gets off on like oh yeah I mean no another movie would have just treated her as like dumb and like not caring or just kind of but like this she's actually like yeah she kind of it's not her thing necessarily she doesn't like come from that world but she's really like oh yeah i like these guys they're goofy and fun and you don't get any sense of like oh they're like competing for her affections or anything like that it never turns into that it's really just like they just like being around her and of course they want to fuck her but like i mean who knows maybe they're maybe they're all off having threesomes in the the corner yeah probably yeah i believe it (laughs) The only thing I watched was I finished Hell on Wheels uh, last week. Mm-hmm. It was great. I definitely got to say it's probably one of the best TV shows I've ever seen. Uh, I was really satisfied with the ending, and that's about all I can really say about spoiling too much. So uh, been... <laughs> I, I got to check that out. I've um, just one more thing. I have been. Um, I'm almost finished with Justified. I'm okay. in the middle of season six now, and I didn't catch season six when it aired. I kind of ended up having to drop it for life reasons uh, about three quarters of the way through season five. So I'm now up to stuff that I've never seen. One day we're going to have to do some Elmore Leonard stuff because I have mm-hmm. been, as part of another project, I've been reading rum punch, which is the the book that got made Jackie into Brown. Um, Jackie Brown. And I've read a couple of, uh, I've, I mean, I've read a bit of Leonard, not a lot. Justified gets Leonard better than most of the stuff that uh, adapts Leonard gets Leonard. Right, mm-hmm. and that's kind of a, a big enough topic that I think we need to cover at some point. But yeah, I've been kind of been kind of delving into Leonard. Justified is a great show. I really love this show. It's a fun, pulpy crime uh, drama. 
and uh, tons of great characters. You know, it's it's spotty in places, you know, it definitely kind of, it, it never drags, but it definitely kind of has some elements where you're kind of like watching it for the first time, not knowing necessarily where the story's going. I kind of feel like, uh, what's the point of this, you know? Mm-hmm. But it does mostly wrap up those subplots and it does get, like, like season five just kind of started to weigh on itself a little bit. And then um, towards the end of season, like at the end, now that I finally saw the end, I was like, oh, now it totally makes sense why they did all that stuff, you know? <laughs> um, so so it does it does seem to like kind of reward the effort a little bit more than some other shows um, that, that just do tend to bloat a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I know I've I mentioned it before. It's, it's again, one of those just fun television shows. But um, I'm almost done with it. Probably by this time next week when we record again, I will uh, be finished with it and tell you how much I hated the ending. That's probably what's going to happen. I'm, now that I've spoken, of, I'm going to watch the last six episodes and go, well, that sucked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just just to tighten the Elmore Leonard talk into one of the movies we're doing, uh, Charles Bronson, he, right around the same time, uh, in the same era that he did uh, Violent City, um, he was in Mr. Majestic, which is an Elmore Leonard. Yeah, I was. I, I had I had kind of caught that in my kind of uh, peripheral research. <laughs> was 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 going to recommend, hey, let's check this out. To, to kind of cover my 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 little going through an Elmore Leonard phase right now, so uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll cover that. I we'll talk off air. I've got a lot of ideas for stuff that uh, we're going to cover. We've been talking in the back channels, and mm-hmm. we've got lots of stuff. But I'm I'm hoping to do some of the um, '60s Italian crime stuff because I I ran across some titles that looked interesting through my you know just perusing stuff, and uh, I've got to see if I can source them. Is cool. the uh, problem yeah, I'm yeah. running into? Um, but I've got some I've got some cool titles that I'm gonna I'm gonna throw at you here, Lee. So. Um, you know, right. yay, listeners, because I know Lee isn't going to cut any of this shit out, but yay, listeners, maybe we'll do some 60s crime dramas if I can find them. Mmm, ah! great coffee. Mmm. Hey, hmm? Chad, who's that strange, somber man on the cover of that book you're reading? Oh, that's H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, I've heard of him, but I never really got into his stuff. It's kind of strange and hard to read. Oh, I used to think that, too. But that all changed when I started listening to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. What's that? The H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast is a weekly podcast. Tell me more. Well, these two really smart and hilarious guys give a synopsis of the story, then they talk about its background, the critical views, and what it says about the author. Well, where can I listen? Well, let me tell you, Chris. You can go to hppodcraft.com or, heck, just subscribe through iTunes. It's that easy. Oh, Chad, I'm so excited. Now I can listen to this podcast and pretend to all my snooty friends that I actually read and understand H.P. Lovecraft. Hey, that's what I do. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) HPPodcraft.com Badasses, Boobs, and Body Counts is a weekly podcast that discusses grindhouse and exploitation cinema. Your three hosts, Mike. It's a quick. <laughs> Thank you. Come again. Not racist at all. Mark. If you bend over and you have what is essentially a pubic cottontail coming out of the crack of your ass, you need to do some goddamn grooming. And listener favorite, Iris. I do not have sex with that horse. <laughs> <laughs> will make you question your own political correctness while laughing at theirs. Episodes drop every Sunday and can be found by searching BB and BC Podcasts via Libsyn, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and iHeartRadio. You can also listen to episodes directly from the show's website at badassesboobsandbodycounts.com. Clytus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? An obscure body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. How peaceful it looks. Most effective, Your Majesty. We will destroy this Earth. Destroy it utterly. Send Rick and Danny in wool rocket Ajax. So, just destroy it? That's what Ming said. Don't you ever listen? Well, there's no arguing with Ming. Hail Hail Ming. Ming. Wait! You see those transmissions on the Visua screen? Crow? Nightmare on Elm Street? Chud 2? Black Belt Jones? 
Nightbreed? What's a critter? Oh, I've seen those things. Flash? I guess we could wait a while before the destruction. Yeah, and watch the movies. And talk about them. The Hell Ming Power Hour. Disobedience to Ming. For now. You can find us at Legion Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. iTunes. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. At www. You know what? Just Google it for yourself. Just Google it, you bastages. Hell Ming. Breaking two? Electric Boogaloo? Samurai Cop? Army of Darkness? Flash Dance? <laughs> <laughs> we might destroy the planet if it's Flash Dance. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Huh. Necrophilia. Uh, uh, uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get out of it. It's unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything that kept little history doll popping up at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped watching this shit at twelve years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How did you watch this shit at twelve? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Okay, I guess we can move on now to our first film, Violent City, also known as The Family from 1970. Hello, who is it? There's someone waiting to kill you. What? You can see him if you look out of your porthole. Being a killer is easy if you're a member of The Family. I want that film. And I want you to join our little family. I've been a know of it all my life, Liver. But when a private killer cuts into the family business, being a killer is suicide. Why is it whenever I'm with you, I always end up in the middle of blood and violence? The orphan sets up a one-man business with new rules. No rules. <laughs> The only part of the family he wants is their most beautiful women. It's better. Give 
us the courage to pull a trigger? Let me tell you, Jeff. You know, you ate the apple and they're going to throw you out of the Garden of Eden. Here is a motion picture that doesn't waste a second, that runs with the speed of the death crowd and stops. Only for a target. Ah! Ah! The devil is all the family the orphan will ever need. No. The family puts you in the middle of a killer's quarrel and leaves you with a sting of excitement. Directed by Sergio Solima, written by Ardinio Mayururi. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to get that name right. Uh, Massimo Di Rita, Saro Scavellini, Gianfranco Caligarich, uh, Linda Wertmuller, and Sergio Solima. And I think Linda Wertmuller actually went on to be a director herself. Charles Bronson stars as Jeff Heston. Jill Ireland, his wife, stars as Vanessa Shelton. Mitchell Constantine as Killane. Telly Savalas as Al Weber. Umberto Orsini as Steve. Ray Saunders as Prisoner. Benjamin Lev as Jeff's mate. And Peter Dane as television host. And I'll let you uh, give us a synopsis there, Daniel. So I'm going to admit right now that I have, uh, I'm, I'm half phoning it in today. Um, <laughs> because I did write a full synopsis for Revolver, but I'm stealing this one from Wikipedia for Violent City. So um, my apologies, but you will get a full Daniel um, discussion of uh, Revolver. But here you go, Violent City 1970. The film opens with professional assassin Jeff Heston, Charles Bronson, and Mistress Vanessa, Jill Ireland, pursued mercilessly while holidaying in the Virgin Islands. Jeff is shot and left for dead, while Vanessa runs off with his shooter and former business associate Coogan. After his release from prison on on a framed murder charge, Jeff tracks the pair to New Orleans. However, after taking revenge on his betrayer and reuniting with Vanessa, Jeff is blackmailed by the very crime boss, Telly Savalas, who framed him, took Vanessa as his mob wife, and who is now intent on having him join his organization. When Jeff refuses, he is hunted through an unforgiving city, only to discover that his real enemy is closer than he realized. I think it sums it up pretty well, because this film, although I think Salima does try to go for some deeper things here, the film is generally pretty broad strokes. It's not overly complicated. Uh, I'll go to you first. What are your sort of uh, initial thoughts on this one? Well, through a series of uh, events, which uh, I will, I will get to here shortly, which it will be amusing because I know we're going to talk about the versions of this film. Mm -hmm. And I have some things to say about that when we get there. So I actually, I actually ended up buying the DVD and uh, I'm not sorry for that. I actually really, I really enjoyed the film a lot. Um, It's not, I mean, revolver is clearly the better film. I think when when we get to revolver is clearly better, but this is a, really nice actioner i really love um it's got a uh, kind of opening car chase sequence it's like nine minutes long mm-hmm. that is um basically kind of it's both temporarily and conceptually about halfway between bullet and the french connection you know right um but done on done on a what what appears to be a, a much smaller budget than than either of those films have mm-hmm just because of the interior process shots, but a really nice car chase sequence right at the very beginning. I mean, really surprising to me because I'm used to kind of opening these things and then kind of going, all right, you kind of got 20 minutes of like, okay, we're setting up the stuff and then we get into some, some cool action. Yeah. No, right here at the beginning, you get like a really nice fun action sequence. It really is probably the best thing in the film. If we're going to be quite honest about it. Yeah. So Salima claims that he wasn't influenced by bullet, but I call bullshit on that one. I mean, it's clearly some of, the, some of the shots are clearly stolen right from bullet. There, there's a there's a flying hubcap, and yeah. I don't I don't know that there's anything else I need to say about. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, but 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 it is cool because the uh, the streets and stuff are much more congested and tight, so it's more claustrophobic. Yeah, car yeah no, there's that that great moment where um, they have to like like uh, push the the truck aside. Oh yeah, in terms yeah. Of get, like it's such a you wouldn't like I'm watching it and going like what the fuck are we, we're stopping for this for this truck and we're gonna like push it out of the way with our cars. I mean, it's 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 really well done. I mean, it, it compares favorably with really any chase sequence. Uh, uh, have you ever seen Ronin? 
the Robert De Niro? I have. I have. Very I saw that theatrically. Thing. I saw that theatrically oh, nice. in the 90s and have not seen it since. Maybe we need to cover that one at some point. Cause Very similar car chase. Yeah. Very similar car chase, though. So. Yeah, I remember really liking that film. Then we kind of move on. We get... I mean, Jill Ireland is great. I, I think she's 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 a lot of fun. Is uh, she kind of ends up being the uh, the kind of femme fatale of this? Yeah. And you don't quite realize that that's what's going on until until kind of the last third of the film, which is really interesting. There's some really uh, there's another uh, kind of a second great action sequence where uh, Charles Bronson is assassinating a guy, and you just kind of get this web of intrigue. You get there's some there's some great photography. Tell Telly Savalas, who doesn't show up until nearly an hour into the film. Yeah. Uh, but like steals every scene he's in. I mean, he's he's great and um, kind of goofy is this kind of mob boss guy. Um, I, I really like that he's uh, he's both. Uh, it's it's very modern in the way that it um, uses him as both a figure of kind of fun and a figure of of menace. You know, he's mm-hmm. gonna get those, those great glasses he wears in that one scene. Right, instance, he keeps you know, pushing them up too. Yeah, yep, yep. yeah. Uh, fun film. It has a, a really nice ending. I, I really love kind of. The cinematography and the and just the, kind of the sound design and stuff, the way it ends. I think we'll get into that um, a little bit later on. But yeah, uh, really enjoyable. There's not. I mean, you can kind of read some political stuff into this, but this is really just kind of straight up. Uh, it, it plays for me more as a neo noir than it does than anything mm-hmm. else. You know, um, it's not quite playing on that same thematic field, but I think it makes sense seen through that lens. I think it's it's kind of like a neo-noir with some cool action scenes that are kind of thrown in and with this sort of high class <laughs> uh, assassin kind of character instead of like the, the kind of ordinary schlub that you normally see in, in a, in a, um, in a noir, but um, uh, really enjoyable. I watched it twice in preparation for this podcast and uh, I enjoy it both times. It, it's a nice little watch. I recommend it. I really like this one. I think it is a, a little flawed, but Salima himself has said in interviews that he picked up the script and he didn't like it. Like they did as much doctoring on it as they could to try to make it some something workable. He said it was very, very bad when he first got to it, the first draft he saw. And he actually did this film solely because he got to shoot on location in the U.S. in different places like New Orleans, San Francisco. So he got to do that. And I think he does a pretty good job with it, with what he's got. It really is just two big set pieces uh, sandwiching in a lot of sort of intrigue and convoluted kind of plot. The sort of flashback stuff is Salima's work that's the, that's written into the script by him. He, he It wasn't in there before, so it kind of... <laughs> well, and, and suddenly that goes, well, yeah, without the flashback stuff, there's really nothing else in this film, you know? Mm-hmm. Until the very end, and um, you, then you have to think just how much of that is Salima as well. How much? How much the, the sort of uh, because you've really got four main characters, or mm-hmm. I guess five, with. Um, well, you got Bronson as Jeff, and then you have Vanessa, then you have mm-hmm. Telly Savalas, then you have the crooked lawyer who works for Savalas, yeah. and mm-hmm. then you have um, Jeff's uh, friend uh, Kilane there, who's the other hitman, right. who's the heroin addict. Right. And then you got the, um, the oh, guy, uh, Coogan. Uh, Coogan, who... Uh, who so. Nobody knows who the fuck that guy is. He's not listed in the IMDb. He's just an unknown <laughs> guy. Like, no one knows... No one. He, they even asked Salima, and apparently he doesn't even know who he was. He was, he was apparently some actor, but no one's been able to pin him down. Wow. That's so, pretty... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of good, too, so you're kind of surprised. Yeah, no, like, no he's... one's ever seen him again doing anything, and... No, he might have been an extra for all anyone knows. <laughs> Maybe he was a stunt guy or something. You know, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was like a uh, he was a guy who uh, looked good in a uh, in a racing helmet, and then that was he like, might have been a real he might have been a real racing driver because apparently there's a couple of famous uh, race car drivers from back in the day as well have sort of on screen cameos because nice. they you know they filmed on a real racetrack and shit. So <laughs> he, he might have he might have been like an Italian race driver or something like that too. You never know. But they, he's not listed anywhere. I, I was looking for him for. Like all through the week, I was trying to do research on this, and I couldn't find him. <laughs> it's like fuck. He's just, well, he's just maybe, a ghost. maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll go dig into this the way I did for uh, Papushka back in the day. Or yeah, Papushka, yeah. <laughs> I'll find him. It's gonna... Turns out he was a singer. He had a, he had a, he was a lounge act for a while. You know, he ended up he ended up going into politics afterwards. You know, something like yeah. But yeah, this this works for me pretty well. I think it benefits, of course, from having Bronson just be Bronson. And this is right around the time where he was the top box office draw in Europe. Both him and Savalas, their careers kind of stalled in America. So they were both 
like just kicking ass and taking names in Europe and all these genre films. A lot of them, of course, were not really up to their talents, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, you, you look, you watch Savalas in this and you, you can kind of tell he doesn't give a shit, but even when he doesn't give a shit, he fucking owns the entire film whenever he's on it. He did the same on Horror Express. He, he just, he just waltzed in for his cameo, his extended cameo, basically, and owned the entire film for the time he was on there. I mean, that's how good he was. Jill Ireland, I see her get a lot of shit for her performance in this. I disagree. I think the first half of the film, she's purposely playing. And again, I'll, I'll say this. I've seen a lot of her stuff. She's not actually that great of an actress. But for what she does in this film, the first half of the film, is it's all put on anyway. She's overly dramatic for a reason. And when we get to the final act of the film, you see the real her. And it really comes out as pretty uh, a good little uh, change there, a little switch up. I'll tell you what I what I really appreciated with her was her. Um, I mean, and, and this is you know obvious once you realize who she is, but mm-hmm. she's really great with Bronson. I think like there's a real. I mean, she's not a great actress, but she has this kind of warmth of physical performance where you sort of because you, we're 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 kind of left with this. How do these two people feel about each other? Is kind of the crux of the film like, mm-hmm. in terms of like what how you feel about how it, what it means and what the ending means and all that sort of thing, you know? And there are certain sequences, which I now realize we're not even in the American cut, mm-hmm. which are uh, really essential to kind of understanding that as well. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, is she playing him the whole time or is there this kind of, or is there, is there some kind of relationship? And also like, how real is that rape scene? Uh, by the mm-hmm. way, you know there there is. I, I hesitate to even call it that because I mean it. it and this more just like dicey territory because it's like, well, she's kind of like faking not wanting yeah. this sort of thing. But like I think that like that is that is kind of a moment where you know you start to see a rape in these kind of films, and I you know it's it's kind of oh fuck we're doing this again and you immediately. Well, think, yeah. Actually, this is a little more interesting. There's a little bit more going on. Like, it might actually be justified. I'm not saying it is justified, but I'm saying it might be justified. And then um, film kind of uses that as the uh, impetus to kind of give us the title, Violent City, which is a terrible mm-hmm. title. Yeah. <laughs> and the family isn't much better, so I don't know. It, it's um, a little bit really better. Like- but I don't really that, like either the the titles for the film. Yeah, the 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 American re-release title or whatever the family is there to capitalize on the Godfather. I mean, oh. the, po- the posters actually even had the same font as the Godfather for the family title. So <laughs> that's that's how shameless they were with it. Eh? But yeah, actually, I mean, just going into Vanessa's character, she is essentially the f- femme fatale. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Out of the Past from 47, it's kind of a reworking of that. It, it, it doesn't really follow the plot strictly you know it's very different but it it is kind of a reworking of that idea with a femme fatale who plays every male in the in in the movie i mean vanessa basically just plays everybody she she acts like a helpless victim a hapless you know she's always talking about how dumb she is and how she's always making mistakes and stuff like that when really she's the one who's been playing everybody for a long time in this film and bronson's character Kind of his story is he's the hitman who suddenly gains a conscience and falls in love, and then when he's wronged, he he, he goes way too far, way overboard uh, in his quest for for revenge. So, but uh, in general, his character he's duped as well. Everyone's duped in this. I think Telly Zavallis is the only guy in this who knows he's being duped and willingly lets it happen because he kind of he kind of enjoys it. <laughs> he kind of enjoys being I, dominated. I think that. I think that the thing for me with Bronson's character is that I, I sort of get him as someone who he doesn't care if he's being played. Like, I mean, in the scene with T- Savalas, I mean, and, and, mm-hmm. and we maybe we can disagree on this or we can talk about it, but I kind of get him as someone who he kind of he loves this girl regardless at that moment, you know, like mm-hmm. he's and whether that's like he's just enveloped in her charms or whether he, he's but but it, I mean, it really is just Savalas tells him like, look, she's laughing all the way. You know, she, she's fucking you over, dude. Like it doesn't you're done looking at Bronson and kind of watching his performance. It's kind of like it's not that he disagrees. He just doesn't care, you know, like and, and so and that, that may be just, you know, maybe me reading into that a little bit, you know? Yeah, um, I, I read I, different. Like, I, I read that he doesn't believe Savalas. I, I, I read that he doesn't trust Savalas because one one of the things about this is Savalas, of course, is blackmailing him with pictures showing him uh-huh. uh, taking out Coogan in the assassination. <laughs> Which, um, by the way, it's just a shot of a guy in the wilderness, in the in like in a in a shrub with a rifle. Like I, I, the whole the whole thing is like it's 
like, how are you going to authenticate this if it's just like, well, a photo of a guy? Like, well, you know, the, the film, wife? the film kind of does that though when he goes back to look of, at where the person who shot the photos had their vantage point from. Right. So it, it kind of shows you all <clears throat> the landscape and everything like that. So it, I, I guess it kind of maybe not a hundred percent, but it sort of semi informs. Yeah, that, no, I mean. It, it, it's justified, like, just kind of in the, like, okay, there's, these are incriminating, you know, they mm-hmm. need to not, you know, that sort of thing. But I was kind of like, like, what kind of flimsy legal pretext is that? You know? Yeah, like, well. Any decent lawyer is going to get him off for that. Like, this is just a dude with a <laughs> rifle, you know, come on. Yeah, but. You're, um, you're a Louisiana motherfucker, like, you know. <laughs> Well, I assume they probably have even more on them, and this is just kind of like icing on the top yeah. of the cake too, right? But, yeah, she, they go in to get the negatives, and she destroys the negatives, but she walks off with the <laughs> photos, and Zavallis tells them, she's walking off right now copies of those photos. She's still got you under her thumb. Right. And he just kind of laughs it off. Like, if if she had really done that, you would have said it the first thing. And Zavallis, being kind of a obtuse kind of a fellow, kind of crime boss who sees kind of humor and everything, was like, no, because I knew you were here to kill me anyway, regardless. So I wanted to, you know, torture you a little bit for it. Just yeah. get a little laugh at the end. I remember that sequence. I guess, I guess for me, I just, I just read it a little differently. Where, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's less, it's less that he's, he just doesn't care if it's true or not. He's just, he's, yeah. and, and I mean, this is, this is a, um, this is a thing. I mean, maybe just because I'm interpreting it to through noir, you know. I mean, you think about something like Double Indemnity, where Barbara Stanwyck just has. Frank McMurray just he kind of knows he's being played, but he doesn't care that he's being played, you know. So sort of yeah, thing, you I, know? I I agree with the the idea. I just think Savalas is actually that character in this film. Yeah, one of the things I love about Savalas is that he's like, yeah, she's got to go off and like fool around with guys. She always comes back. It's fine. Don't worry. Like it's it's such a um, he's such an interesting character. I mean, it's such that sort of and again very modern in the way that it kind of interprets the crime boss as this sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, almost, almost a vuncular figure. You know, this this sort of like a. Well, that's that's where the the small little bit of politics comes into this as well. Like politic uh, kind of read in this, where he's talking about how he's built this criminal <coughs> empire and he's got all these lawyers and stuff working for them now, and he built this great building, but they don't want him to show up there at any point because he's bad for business at this point. So he's like. Mm-hmm. It's kind of this coming together of capitalism and uh, crime, you know, becoming becoming something different than just a bunch of gangsters shooting themselves in the street and shit. Because he he talks about, I miss the good old days where we were just killing people. Now I have to sit here in this boardroom full of lawyers and they're running my business for me and they're telling me to stay out of the limelight. And I'm basically just sitting here kind of thinking, well... I kind of want to go back to the days where I can hire you and have you kill some people for me and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. There's, there's definitely that element. I mean, I love, I mean, and this is, this is kind of the thing that the Elmore Leonard books are kind of full of this to, to some degree of the, mm-hmm. the, like, you start off in crime and then eventually you just go legit. And then like, you can make way more money if you go legit, you know, mm-hmm. like, like you, you use the same skills, but you just do it in the like slightly more legal way. Um, and then suddenly you're you're golden. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Savalas is great. It's it's a great character. There is the political read on this, and and there is. I mean, I mean, it it feels almost like a dry run for Revolver in a way. You know, kind of um, mm-hmm. watching it that way because it is kind of like it's playing with some of these ideas that all this stuff is connected, but it isn't really connecting them. And partly yeah. that's the script just isn't yeah. really interested in that. And um, I don't think anybody involved was really kind of pushing that too hard. It's kind of there. You can read it, but. It's also just a little bit. Um, one reason I didn't go through it with a fine tooth comb and do this do this plot justice was just because there's there's no point in like going too deep into the analysis of this. No, it's it, it, more of a ride. It, it's it's a ride, and it, it really is built around these two action sequences, and then um, the final sequence, which rewatching it because I did watch it twice rewatching it, I had forgotten that you actually saw that building with the elevator um, mm-hmm. in the, when they're, when they're in the car and he's talking about the, uh, you know, yeah. I, I used to rob that bank and now I own it, you know, sort yeah. of thing. You actually see that. So it is a little bit of like foreshadowing there that like, Oh, we're going to end up in this, in this elevator and uh, people are going to get shot. The, essentially the opening and the ending of the film have uh, two <clears> sequences <throat> where it's all, there's no dialogue. And, and in the case of the elevator scene, there's like no sound except for when it, when it cuts to Bronson's character after he shoots them. 
<laughs> you, you you get you get basically the silence gunshots, but that's it. Crack it through the glass. You get the, you get the tink of the glass. Not even not even a full on, just a little bit of a like, tink, and that's yep. that's the only sound you get. And it's it's really effective. And um, you know, it is kind of one of those things, especially when you're watching like a streaming version of this film, where it's like, did my sound just go? <laughs> like, is there some problem with the print? But right. um, no, it's 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 intentional and it's effective. And I uh, I did it. really enjoy that sequence. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's not, I don't know, there's not much more to say about it necessarily. It's its just kind of a fun ride, and it's a, a fun movie. So uh, the version you saw of this was the one with the restored um, elements to it? Okay, so let's talk about this. Yeah, okay. So you give me a title, I find it, I just watch it. Like, I've kind of mm-hmm. explained this process, because I really love coming at these cold, you know? So I don't watch trailers, I, don't, I just, like, sit down and watch it. Right. My uh, Amazon Prime, I have the Full Moon subscription, and this is included in Full Moon, right? Mm-hmm. So, great. Hit play. I start watching the film. You know, the first dialogue isn't even until nine minutes into the freaking film, right? So, you know, I'm kind of watching it. I'm, and it's only the speaking Italian. For, like, big ch- you know, there's a big prison sequence, which is 80% just Italian without subtitles. Yeah. And at first I'm sitting and I'm thinking, like, oh, this must be, like, intentionally disorienting for, you know, we're supposed to be following Charles Bronson's character and he doesn't speak Italian. And then, no, that's not what's happening. And then they're, they're cutting back and forth between Italian and not Italian. And then it keeps going forward through the rest of the film. You keep running into this. And so I just started, I, I had to Google it. And then I realized, okay, there's 140 or an hour and 43 cut of this, which is the English language cut. Right. The hour and 50 minute cut, which is the version that I watched is the what they've done is they've restored the scenes from the Italian dub or the Italian mm-hmm. language, but they never dubbed that. Like, it was never uh, dubbed into English to begin with. Yeah. So there's no English dub. So they just, on the DVD, they have subtitles that go up during those sequences so you can kind of see what's going on. And it's, it's, it's actually a pretty effective thing. This is the place where we are with, like, four pay streaming services right now is that they have this back catalog. They figured out how to do that, but they seem to have no quality control over this because the mm-hmm. subtitles are not present on the version <laughs> that is actually streaming. So you just are listening there watching the movie, wow. and, then, and then suddenly they're just speaking Italian, and there's no like explanation or concept for it, which is really fucking frustrating for... I mean, I understand when it's just like, oh, we've got this giant library of this shit that we're throwing out there that's like an old VHS rip. This is clearly something that somebody put some effort into, and like that problem isn't solved. So um, I definitely need to... Uh, I guess I need to email somebody and complain about it, <laughs> um, which I normally don't do. But that is like one of those things where I'm like, I am paying for that subscription. I feel like that is something that I can, can justifiably complain about. You know, I, I went through a process and I said, OK, I could tell Lee I can't because I, then I was searching for like a, a torrented version or something. Right. And I like on the time frame we were on, I couldn't find a copy that both had because I found the hour 43 cut. But mm-hmm. I wanted to watch the full cut, particularly the sequence where they're in the um, swamp in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to see what was going on with that dialogue because it's very clear that that's important dialogue. And the fact that that's not even in the English language cut is uh, ridiculous. I mean, basically all the stuff that's cut out of the English language, I mean, you're kind of rewatching it, all the stuff that's cut out is anything that has any kind of thematic resonance whatsoever. Because right. like, Americans just don't understand his subtext. Yeah, in, in the American version, it's basically Charles Bronson's just killing that woman because she wronged him. There's no explanation right. why. It's just, oh, she's just dumb. She just wronged him. <clears throat> right, you know? and you don't get that that moment where she kind of gets her own. She gets to speak for herself. Yeah. You know, and kind of say, "You yeah, kill me. Go ahead and kill me." And then, no, we're gonna go fuck for three days. <laughs> yeah, always always a good thing if you've got if you get to fuck Jill Ireland for three days. In yeah, uh, like, uh, or, or at the very least, you get to fuck extra footage of her body double. <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> so yeah, that's the version that I watched. So I did, I did a buy and rush ship the DVD specifically nice. so I could do it on this show because I felt really bad about uh, missing last week. <laughs> so oh, I was like, all right, I owe it to Lee. We're gonna do this. I really want to see this. I was, uh, you know, if I'd waited a week, I wouldn't have bought it, and I would. And I thought about just coming on here and being like, I have no idea what's going on during a good like forty percent of this movie because it's all in Italian and making a joke out of it. 
but then I was really interested. So, you know, yeah. Nice. So that, well, that's the story of how I came to watch this film. Well, your sacrifice is appreciated. <laughs> and, and it's not even a sacrifice because I own I own a pretty good film, so it's it's worth. Um, although yeah. no English subtitles on the DVD, which is because I I always like watching films with subtitles when I can. Yeah, so. it's, it is interesting though. Uh, Bronson, it, it, do you know how old Bronson was when he when he did this? I would I don't I would guess maybe forty. He was forty nine. Wow. Yeah. Do you do you see how good he fucking looks at the he, beginning I, of that movie? I, well, he looks, he's, he's shirtless for a good, I mean, he's got at least two extended shirtless scenes, and he, he looks, I mean, he's not doing the, like, Schwarzenegger thing, that you know, where, where he's going to do it 10 years later, no, but he's, he's at just, least as good looking as, like, Stallone was going to be in the 80s, you know, I mean, yeah, he's, he's got just, this he's just nice fit. physique, yeah. Fit as fuck. And it's funny, he's, he's supposed to be, in the script, he's supposed to be a generation younger than Savalas' character. <laughs> they were both. They were both essentially the same age, uh, right, right, right. and Bronson was actually like three months older than Savalas at this nice. point. So, and um, apparently they wanted John Voight first for the Bronson <laughs> role. That yeah, I can't imagine that. But um, and uh, yeah. they wanted they wanted Sharon Tate for the Vanessa role, but of course she died before they started filming. So right, right, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like Bronson in this, and this would have been—I um, mean, this would have been right after Once Upon a Time in the West, because that's that's like, oh well, I mean, it would have been like a year later, two years later. Yeah, but he he made he made a handful of films between that, so uh, this was you know this was him capitalizing off the sort of stardom he had built from that and a couple other films in Europe. So, and this kind of led him to uh, be rediscovered in the U.S. and eventually he did Death Wish, which really. And he was like fifty three or something by the time he did Death yeah, Wish, that would which have been like four years later. So yeah, that finally sense. propelled him as a, like a superstar over here instead of just in Europe. So it's right. and and uh, Savalas would go on to do Kojak, and that was his big break in America too. Really, so they they both got their big breaks like really late in life as far as actors go. So yeah. which is always always a good thing to know. You know, I'm officially entering my late thirties this year. Um, so uh, you know. Maybe maybe I have a I have a career as an action star. Uh, I, can, <laughs> I can start I can start sometime around twenty twenty two and uh, you know yeah yeah there's always there's always that hope man. <laughs> so I will just mention uh, there is no Blu Ray release of this as far as I can tell. The original Anchor Bay DVD version is very hard to come by, but it's the one I got, and that of course has the restored footage. And there was also. Uh, carry over to Blue Underground. Just about everything from Anchor Bay was carried over to Blue Underground in, uh, I think it was 2008 or something like that. Um, yeah, box office was 1.1 million whatever in France and 1.03 million in Spain, lira, rubles, sawdust, whatever they use as currency over there. I don't know. Um, <laughs> what did you think of the score by uh, Morricone, though? I like the score. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of... Um... It kind of grew on me a bit, you know. It's kind of got mm-hmm. do 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 do. You know, it's it's got it's definitely one of those kind of throbbing scores. Uh, yeah. Definitely not like on that like top tier Morricone stuff because I listen to a lot of the you know the, the spaghetti western, all the classics that you know from from Morricone. But uh, this this is kind of that more functional side, you know, where he's he's kind of you know he's it's but it, but it's well made functional you know music. At first, I was kind of on that like okay, this is just Morricone not phoning it in, but just kind of doing his all right. He's doing the he's doing the thing that he does. But then, kind of like as I was, you keep listening to it because it plays through a big chunk of the film and it it grows it grew on me quite a bit. And I'm I'm kind of like it is it is very uh, hummable, listenable. Yeah. You know? I, it, it's it's very similar to the score on the next film we're going to be doing as well too. It's, it's very, <laughs> it is very indeed. Um, I, I, for a while, I was convinced he just basically ripped off his his uh, original score and just changed it around a bit. But it, it, if you actually do listen to them, and I actually did this today just to make sure they are actually quite different, but there there is similarities in them where they they kind of push the same kind of energy uh, forward in them, right? Well, you got to think like I mean. Morricone scored like what three hundred movies or something like that. Yeah. I mean, he's still working today, so he's still he's still scoring. So you know, you got to think like this is the, I mean, this is the the low budget, the stuff that was just you know, I mean, how much time could he have had to do to do the, a lot of this stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're pumping them out at that kind of rate, it's just like all right, 
I know how to do this. This is this is this is a job for hire. This isn't the let's make the masterpiece with Leon yeah. Lee kind of stuff, you know. And I don't have I don't have any um ill will towards towards him for for that at all i mean i i speak of that not negatively I speak because that is like yeah he's a working composer he's yeah. you know he's got a job to do he's he's on a time scale he's on a budget like get it done um the fact that it's as listenable as it is as it is is kind of you know remarkable in and of itself I, yeah I, Mar- morricone I, I i actually i do typically call morricone the greatest of all the film composers and uh yeah, it's pretty much up there for me. I, I might be, I might be able to argue against it, but I don't really want to at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is going to be a fight. No, yeah. um, no, I, uh, I I appreciated the score. I, uh, I I'm sorry I forgot to mention it just because I did I did enjoy it. Um, but it is it's you know it's functional film music, and I don't. It's memorable now that I'm thinking of it. And since I, I watched the film, I rewatched the film just this afternoon in preparation for it. Because I did, again, behind the curtains here, I rec- I said on Wednesday night, hey, let's throw in another film. And we record yeah. on Friday. So I watched it streaming on Thursday and then had to like rush ship it to me to get it here by this <laughs> afternoon. So I could rewatch it with the Italian. And then I got a notice from Amazon like, oh, your shipment has been delayed. And I'm like, well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but he got here on time. Nice. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, enjoyable. I like it. Yeah. Fun film, fun score. Definitely worth checking out. And now we can move on to our next film, which is Revolver, also known as Blood in the Streets in the U.S. and In the Name of Love from 1973. Here is what happens when the killers of three continents deploy an arsenal of hitmen in a shattering shock at showdown. All at once, all over the world, murder was on the move, converging on this one spot. Blood in the Streets. Oliver Reed in a performance that makes Charles Bronson's death wish look like wishful thinking. Your husband. Tell him that you're okay. In the name of love, he killed a man, destroyed another, spit on his badge, tore a city apart, brick by brick, street by street. Pump by pump to 
find his wife. Red letter days in the annals of crime, none deadlier than this. Blood in the streets from Independent International. Blood in the streets. Rated R under 17, not admitted without parents. Uh, well, I, we can talk about whose love that is. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's move on. <laughs> I, I think I know where you're going. Directed again by uh, Sergio Salima and all the same writers again. Minus a couple people from the first one. I'm not going through their fucking names again. Just forget it. Oliver Reed as uh, Vito Caprini. Fabio Testi as Milo Ruiz. Paula Pitagora as Carlota. Uh, Agustina Belli as Anna Caprini. Frederick de Pascal as Michel Granier. Mark Mazza as Police Inspector. Uh, Mark Mazza, you might uh, remember from the Grand Duel as one of the... Uh, Bad Guy Brothers. He was the sheriff from the town, the bald guy. Oh, I'd have to rewatch it probably, but uh, I I believe you. But yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't really uh, care. It was, was, it was fun to see him there. Uh, Reinhard Kaldehoff as the French lawyer. Uh, Bernard Giradou as kidnapper, and Peter Burling as grappa. And I'll let you get to the synopsis there, Daniel. As the film opens, two men fresh from a heist are running from a fast approaching cops in the dead of night. One of the men has been shot and will be dead and buried in a shallow gravel grave by a pond by the survivor Milo Ruiz, Fabio Testi, as the opening credits roll. Immediately thereafter, a public official named Harma Collis is assassinated by a gunman on a motorbike, which connects officials to a pop star who looks like an Italian version of Barry Gibbs, who will become more important later on. First, though, we get what is possibly the greatest use of yellow socks in cinema history in our introduction of our co-lead, Vito Cipriani, Oliver Reed, as he makes tender but aggressive love to his young fiancée, Anna, Agustina Belli. Cipriani is a former police detective termed prison warden, because apparently that's how these things work, a tough man with a tender heart for his beloved. And wouldn't you know, poor Anna is shortly kidnapped, and after a phone conversation with the kidnappers, Cipriani is informed that his wife will be murdered if Cipriani does not find a way to spring Milo Ruiz from the joint. A bit of de- detective flick shoe leather follows as Cipriani attempts to discover who is keeping his wife without freeing the criminal, but eventually he engineers an escape, and after some tension, the two men join forces in an attempt to free the lovely Anna. This leads into a complicated web of relationships, leading back to the pop star, who has connections to organized crime, which leads him back to high-level political intrigue. The pop star ends up dead, with Anna Cipriano framed for it, and the men of power essentially offer him a deal, the life of his new confederate for that of his blushing bride. He is offered the choice, in a surprisingly bleak and philosophical ending, between the power of the bureaucracy and the power of the revolver. And if you have any doubt as to which way Cipriani eventually swings, just recall the title of the film. Yeah, excellent. Man, this is a complicated film. There's a lot going on it. Yeah, th- this is a film that I've seen a lot of times, and... I still don't know every little <coughs> twist and turn in detail to to my full um, understanding. I, I just, I don't, <laughs> there's some stuff I don't get in this, but I do get the main thrust of what's going on. When I did, oh, um, when, when a lot of times if I am like really looking to dig into the details, I will sit down and like outline the entire film as I'm watching it. Mm-hmm. Like with a notebook and just essentially write down everything that happens and then piece it together later. Um, I did not go through that effort with this film, but you're right. There's a ton of stuff happening. It's really, I mean, it's confusing again, in the same way the big sleep is kind of confusing, you know, Yeah. that is you feel like there are like, it's explaining these connections to you, but you're not quite sure exactly who's who at any given time and where those connections are coming from. The first time I watched the film, I was like, why, why are we even following this pop star? Like I missed the detail that like, mm-hmm. The, the pop star sold the uh, or 
yeah, sold the motorbike to the guy, to the assassin. And then, like, oh, why like, why do we care about Fabio Testi's character? Why do we care about Ruiz? Except, oh, it turns out that the friend he buried is the guy, you know, is the guy yeah. who's framed for the murder. Or, yeah, um, there's a lot of detail here where it's 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 kind of really confusing, and it would recommend, like, just kind of ignore it at least at first, you know, just, yep. just kind of let us, and that's kind of how noir works a lot of times, you know, is that we're, we're kind of being swept along on mood. The, the structure is there, but don't necessarily try to follow it on a, on a first or second watch, just kind of let it go, follow the performances and then kind of pick it up as you, as you kind of rewatch the film. Right. What are your sort of initial thoughts on this one? I really like this. I was watching this um, again, behind the scenes. I had, I've been, I've been kind of, watching some of these films that um, from these kind of Morricone scores that I've been enjoying for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, this one has the, uh, the tune uh, Un Amiki, Amiki. And I hope that that yep. ends up in the, the final um, bit of it this will. podcast. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the obvious choice, right? Yeah. Uh, it was reused in Inglorious Bastards, which is kind of where I first discovered it, obviously. And so I was just like, Oh, I've, I've heard of this film. I kind of found it online and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to watch it. I think I was talking to you about it and I, you know, I kind of got like an hour into the film. and was just kind of like, yeah, I kind of get where this is going. This, this is, this is a kind of a nice little like kind of police procedural. It's kind of this fun, like the criminal and the cop had to have to join forces to yeah. like, save this girl kind of thing. And that's kind of where you think the film is going at first. You know, it really, um, I mean, I'm an hour into it and I'm kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good, but it's not something that I'm, I'm really like pushing for, you know? And then I kind of mentioned that to you off off air, and you went, "Oh, you need to finish the film," <laughs> and I did, and went, "Oh, well, we need to cover this now," mm -hmm. because I, I think, and I, and I think maybe um, both of these films kind of suffer from this a little bit, in that there's a difference between slow burn and just kind of being filled with stuff that yeah. you don't necessarily, you know. And I think Revolver kind of gives us like this: you've got a lot of character detail at the beginning, and then you've got this sort of like thrilling prison break sequence which is yeah. fun and then you've got some some other characters that kind of pop up you've got a, a lot of kind of stuff that's happening but it's not really leading you anywhere thematically and so it's just sort of like incident without like mm -hmm. necessarily but i think that that's just sort of the i mean i think revolver is actually doing that intentionally it, it's kind of leading you into thinking this is the film you're watching and so when you get to the end it's even more um kind of kind of wrenching and heartbreaking you know, it does. It does kind of flip things on 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 its head. Like it just kind of. It feels like in the first time I watched it, it kind of came out of left field for me in a, in a little way. And then I was like rewatching it, and I'm like, no, actually, it, it's all there in front of you all the time. It's just that you're kind of distracted by. Uh, mostly, you're kind of distracted by fucking Oliver Reed and the way he just fucking eats every piece of fucking celluloid that comes in front of him. He's just he, he's just chewing the scenery like left and right. <laughs> but in, in such a magnificent way, though, yeah, the, the the film is is definitely you know it's kind of the cliche. Oh, you, you got to watch it a couple times to get it. This is definitely one of those films, though, where you, mm -hmm. you got to watch it a couple times. Otherwise, you're going to be going into this uh, if you're familiar with the Poliziotesky genre at all, and you hadn't seen this one yet. You'd be like, "Where's all the action?" Uh, you know, you, yeah. because it's it's not really dependent on that like a lot of them are. There's yeah. hardly any action in this at all. I mean, there's a little bit of, I mean, there are a couple of gunfights and, and a little bit of like, but there's no like big car chase sequence. There's no, yeah. I mean, there's, there's really nothing in this film that does that. I mean, this is, this is really, I mean, to me, the core of this is the relationship between um, Reed and Testy. I mean, it really mm -hmm. is. Uh, you're watching these two guys kind of go at each other at first. And then, you know, they're playing a little bit of cat and mouse. And then when they do, kind of join forces. And I mean, it, they don't even really do that because they're still kind of at odds with each other. I mean, there's yeah. still this very rough wariness. And yet, you know, when we do get to the end and then, you know, kind of Kipriana is kind of faced with this choice and, you know, you think like, well, you know, the life of this like lifelong criminal versus, you know, my, my beautiful bride, like, yeah, that's, that's not a difficult choice, but I mean, it does kind of come down to, it does kind of show that like Reed's character, Kipriana does have a, uh, a like a moral code, a, a sort of, you know, there, there is yeah. this, there is this, he does believe the rules of law and that sort of thing too. Yeah. To he kind of regulate he does have a very strict moral code and his moral code gets slammed up against like hard reality. And it's, it's interesting. Like, the, these two characters are very much sort of uh, diametrically opposed to one another, right? Like they're they're very much from two sides of of a world, um, but well, two very different acting styles as well. I mean, yes. it's, it's it's fascinating watching Testy because 
it's very easy to kind of watch this and go, Reed is like all over the place, but brilliant. And Testy's just kind of like, but Testy is charming as fuck in mm-hmm. this. He's got a real hardness in him as well. Uh, he's got a, I mean, he's he's tougher than he looks, you know? It's great seeing them next to each other. It's almost a Laurel and Hardy kind of you know, yeah. Like vibe. Yeah. Just physically between them. I mean, Testy is great in it. I mean, I would say they're, they're equal performances in, in my mind. Reed is brilliant. I'm not saying he's not, but I think Testy is also really, really good in this. Um, they they work really well together, and although they, they are these two opposing forces and they're never quite on the same page, there is an actual kind of like friendship that de- does develop between the two because they're stuck together for so long. I mean, there's little moments where Reed's character forgets himself and will, you know, like physically touch Testy, like pat him on the back or something like that, like right, yeah. where, you know... They're in the. They're actually in this together. You know, they're not even thinking about it. It just sort of organically happens. Once Cipriani ends up kind of ha- being on the run from the law, and then he uses his his knowledge of the kind of inner workings of the of the police to kind of like work in their favor. But then, like at the same time, you know, uh, Testy has a lot more experience in this, and so that's sort of the moment where they where they start. Oh yeah, we're working together now. We got to yeah. escape Italy. We got to get to. Is it escape? Are they le- they're leaving Italy and they're going to France? To, to France, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, both of these films kind of have that same through line. Like, we're going to France, because yeah. that's where the evil people are, is France. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, an, it's an Italian, West Germany, and France co- co-production as well. So, you know, you get you get the, you, you got the locations, so you might as yeah. well use them, right? No, no, no. It's, I was reading, uh, you know, some, some blog posts about this film, and it is kind of like... And then we're going to end up with, uh, you know, 15 minutes of pointless wandering around in the snow. But... It's gorgeous, so don't complain too much. You know. <laughs> like, okay, I got, I got to ask you, what did you think about the music that played when they did their little trek across the Alps? Did that not? Did that not just like uh, totally come off as like Euro sex comedy instead of like uh, hard? Oh boiled? right, yeah, it's kind of that. that, that it's like, like really um, upbeat, you know, that like rompy kind of thing. You yeah. know, I'm kind of like, well, now we're, we've just entered a new genre, right? We're just, yeah. we're just uh, this woman that we've suddenly Testy ends up with her. Like, yeah. And, and you're kind of like, oh, this is going to be like a... You might, she might as well be carrying pom-poms through, through a big <laughs> chunk of this film, you know? Somehow Testy is, is still a ladies' man while wearing that fucking white jacket he wears. That I... he, he pulls he pulls that thing off, man. I am I am just it, it is um 
I don't I know. If, I don't know if I'm not convinced that's a dude's jacket. I'm pretty sure that might be. A... I I was actually thinking, and this might be way deeper than anybody thought about it. Slaughterhouse Five. You know, uh, Vonnegut describes the the lead Billy Pilgrim as uh, you know having to uh, while they're in the like the internment camp. The um, POW camp in Germany. Right. Billy Pilgrim has to like peel a, a coat off of like a frozen pile of coats, essentially. And the only one he can find is this like undersized like women's coat, you know, and then all the other like prisoners and the soldiers make fun of him. And I did kind of get that vibe. Like there is a little bit of like the, the ridiculousness in that. Yeah. But, you know, then again, um, Testy was wearing those those ridiculous clothes and um, the big racket as well. So I think I think Testy just liked it. I don't know, yeah. or maybe that's just how they dressed him. Like the costume designers just went, "Well, fuck, this might as well, you know, give him. Get, get, he looks good in anything. Like he's, I don't know. he's a pretty man. Give him a pretty coat. It was fashion in the seventies in Italy. Like, what do you want me to say, man? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Testy really does, you really do see his acting chops here even more than you saw in Revolver. I think we mentioned there There was a couple of brief moments in Revolver where you really saw his acting come through. Like here, he really brings it through, I think. Um, you mean the big um, racket? Yeah, big racket, right. Yeah. What did I no, say? I mean, you said Revolver. It's oh, fine. did I? Okay. Never mind. I mean, I I kind of liked him a lot when we did for the apocalypse as well. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of, oh, like this guy, this guy's really good because he's kind of the lead of that. Yeah, and uh, and here he's kind of a co-lead. He's kind of second to 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 Reed. Reed goes big, and Testy kind of goes internalized. And I mm-hmm. think that that really works for the way the character dynamic works because it's almost like Testy is having to kind of play this more subtle game as a way of kind of getting around Reed's just you know absolute desperation and fury at the situation. Yeah. So, Reed, Reed, uh, Reed just goes like headlong and everything. Like he's just bashing heads and and and, and smashing through walls. And and uh, Testy is very much more. He puts on this, you know, sort of happy-go-lucky persona over over his, you know, the hard realities he's actually seen as a as a career criminal. But he's still got that sort of upbeat mentality as well. Well, and even like after he. Um... After he like escapes from prison, which that is that that prison escape sequence is, I mean, that's he just oozes charm, right? I mean, you know, it's yeah, like, oh, I just want to take a shower, you know, come on, you know, and then. And by the way, he did his stunt work for that as well. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. It looks it looks good. I mean, you know, it's a little bit like, oh, do we really need this sequence here? You know, I mean, can can we just move yeah. on to the? But uh, but it's it's a nicely done sequence. But you know, Reed takes him to the phone booth and says, like, call your buddies, and we gotta like, you know, and. And he's like, I don't know who, who, yeah. who are you talking about. He's, I don't know. Like, what he has no head. idea. He has. He, he's and, and it's like, come on. I mean, there there is this, but it, it's it's this very real character moment because Reed is like, I just like risked everything to get you out of this thing so you can save my wife's life. I am giving you this, and you're telling me you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Yeah, but it's a completely real thing on both of their. Um, I, I mean, I totally buy the moment. It's a great. Yeah. Testy's got nothing to lose, and Reed keeps losing things because then later on his old homicide detective partner ends up getting killed as well, trying to help him trying to find his wife. Well, and, and he was the guard who, um, he originally like, tricked away or am I thinking, are there two incidents that I know he was, um, the guy, the guy Testy uh, teamed up with was, I think he was the doctor or coroner or something like that. Some, something, something else in the, in the, in the prison. Okay. But uh, but so he's not a guard at the beginning. He's just, but the, he gets called off to Cipriani's uh, office, and that yeah. allows Testy to escape or Ruiz right. to escape. And then, and this kind of sets the the sort of the sequence, the plot in motion. In a way, is that the uh, the guy kind of shows up and says, like, "Look, I know what just happened. If I testify, like, you're going to be fucked." Cipriani kind of tells him, "Look, this is what's going on. They've got my wife. I got to get her back." And then he's on board. He's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm down to to help out." And then he dies for his trouble five minutes yeah. later. So yeah, you, you did mention the the initial sequence where we're introduced to uh, Cipriani and his wife, which is one of the best opening sequences to introduce characters that I've ever seen on film. I really do love that, where you just track them foot level down the hallway with her standing on his feet, wearing those yellow socks, sexy as hell, interesting yep. as hell. 
And man, what a way to introduce characters. The thing with these sorts of films and, and sort of the, the use of sexuality and nudity, you know, it's so often, I mean, it's an exploitation, right? So it's mm-hmm. often exploitative. It's not like, oh yeah, we're going to throw some tits in our movie. This doesn't feel that way to me. Like there, well, you, don't, real, you don't see her, you don't see her well, naked. You, well, you don't see her naked. You see, I mean, she's obviously sexy. I mean, she's there to, yeah. to be a peril monkey for the film. Like yeah, mm-hmm. the, the film doesn't give her really anything to do yeah. except to be lovely. But she's great at being lovely, and mm-hmm. she it sets up this. You know, there's a. You know, we love her as the audience. We love her because Oliver Reed loves her, but we also yeah. love her because we've seen her and we've seen the tenderness between them. And I think that, particularly Reed's performance is so big and he's so angry and he's such a barrel of a man that the tenderness he shows to uh, his wife or to his. Uh, I guess it's his fiance, but she already or, or they like just that. got married. Yeah, I can't but, remember. But she she already has the name Cipriani, which is the yeah. The so other they, thing. Must they must yeah, have married. They must have. Maybe married. they're newlyweds because yeah. they're the whole thing is that she's like looking to buy like wedding presents or yeah, like, that's uh, right. You know, gifts. So anyway, there's there's a kind of a complicated thing there, but yeah, no, it's it's a really. Um, interesting dynamic they have they really only get the, the kind of one scene together and then towards the end they, they kind of get reunited and she's lovely and she's fine and it doesn't feel like it's i mean she's not utilized as an actress but at the same time it's not just throwing a pretty girl without her clothes on i mean it, it, there really is there really is kind of a character beat there and yeah, she does get there, some some nice dialogue yeah there, there's more of the uh just the standard naked girl stuff later where uh Early on there, where Reed goes to the old, the old, uh, mo- the old mob informant guy that right. scumbag that that he's that he's used to beat up as a detective. Now he's beating him up as the prison warden. He's like, "Where's my goddamn wife?" And then there's like these two really hot naked chicks hanging out with this this dude. Right. <laughs> I'm not saying the film didn't engage in the exploitative practices. I'm just yeah. saying it doesn't do it in that sequence. You know, <laughs> um, no, and and that's a. I mean, it is it is such a. I mean, it is it is kind of such a like cliche or you know. I don't I don't want to. I'm not speaking of negatively. It's a little bit of a cop movie cliche. Like you go and you know, well, the guy yeah, and like you're you're beating I, him up, and then there's the two naked girls in the room, and they're like, ah, you know. But I think that's just a testament to how smart Salima is as a director, though, because he puts those recognizable elements in there so you can still follow along with the story even if you're not getting all the political stuff the first time around you can still go from point a to point b without any worry you know you see oh i recognize this this is hard-nosed oliver reed as a detective smashing the scumbag around for information i i know this so i can get yeah yeah. i mean i'm reminded a little bit of mike's audition right Mm -hmm. where the first like 90 minutes of that movie are just Boring, <laughs> you know? yeah. You know, I, I watched uh, like an interview or I kind of read some stuff, and Mika says, "Yeah, it's it's meant to be kind of. You're supposed to be kind of lulled into this sense of like, why am I watching this? This is fucking bullshit, kind of thing." And then like the ending just kind of is supposed to just you know hit you in the fucking you know kneecaps. I, I have feelings about the way that film works, but we won't. We're not here to talk about that film today. Yeah, um, well, we'll do Mika at some point. But I, I think there's a similar kind of thing at work, and I think that the idea of like twist ending, you know, the, the Shalaman kind of phenomenon, and then there's a twist in the last two minutes that yeah. re makes you reimagine everything you've seen before. This doesn't. This doesn't do that. This does a much more honest kind of way where we know we've been looking for this kind of deeper conspiracy. We know we've been looking for these people who have his wife. We know that there's, I mean, we've seen some of them, but we're looking to see, you know, the characters are looking for these guys. And then when they find them, they just find out it's way bigger than they think it was. Yes. The scene with the, you know, the red tape, the prison bars, or the revolver, which is such a great mm-hmm. sequence and a great line. You know, it kind of reminds me of like Ned Beatty and um, Network. You know, it's kind of got that. Yeah. Scene. This is power speaking. Yep. And you, you know, you get to, you can make this choice, but ultimately power is going to do what power is going to do. And the, I mean, it's bleak. It's bleak as fuck, right? You know? Um, yeah, the, the movie keeps throwing red herons at you at, at who the real villains are, too. I mean, at first, you just think it's the base kidnapping guys who pass by this guy in the in the train in one of the opening sequences or whatever, and you don't think anything of it. You see these bad guys, and then for the first little part of the movie, they're the bad guys. They're the guys we should be looking for and shit. But then it's, no, it's this corporate bureaucrat guy. Right. And then... 
you find out even later on the film that even he's just a pawn who's disposable. So there's even something bigger going on above him. And it's, it's interesting because for the, the time you see him, it's, he's very, very calm and very diplomatic and very, you know, very professional about everything he does and everything he says. But he's got this worried look in his eyes and it's kind of a weird performance. But then later on it pays off because this guy has been like trying to shuck and jive and and try to get things working in order so he can actually save his own fucking skin. Because if all this stuff below him doesn't happen in the right way, he's going to be dead on a slab. And he, in, he eventually ends up there anyway. <laughs> the the issue I ran into in, in kind of um, following the plot of this film is that there's not a plot synopsis that I could find anywhere. It's, especially when I'm writing my plot synopses, it helps to kind of go off of like a sort of someone's kind of got at least the big picture where you can kind of like, okay, this is where the pieces right. are supposed to fit together. This probably would be worth like sitting down and, and uh, kind of analyzing bit by bit and you know, kind of figuring out yeah, um, diagramming the way I did for the big sleep. But uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the real, the real bad guy's faceless. It's, it's a system. It's not a single person. Right. And, and that's, and I think that's what makes it so effective at the end is that so often with these conspiracy, I mean, you know, like the conspiracy is almost like there isn't a conspiracy, you know, the dude is assassinated. Um, Harmacolis is assassinated at the beginning yeah. of the film by some masked guy. And like the point isn't the guy. The point is there's an assassination. And the point is that this is just a power play among like these powerful, wealthy dickheads, you know? Yeah. And, and it isn't like I don't know, maybe maybe there is maybe there's a subtlety here that I'm missing. You know, I don't get the sense that Hamakalis is supposed to be this like great reformer or something. He's it's just like he was in my way, so I killed him. Yeah, I, the fact I, that it's I, not even like a particular dude. It's just this is how the system works, and that's just it. Yeah, he. I think he just he he might have not known too much, but he was just a guy who didn't want to be a cog in the system anymore. So he stepped out of it, and then he got killed for it. But, but well, and then and then what that means is that everyone else in the film, all the people who die in the film, and the the suffering that everybody goes through, it's all just in the service of keeping the gears of this system going. Well, yeah, you know? it, it's, it's, it's a, completely it's, pointless. Other than that. It's a philosophical question, isn't it? It's, it's about whether the lives of certain people should trump within society those who are less important, you know, as far as uh, social status goes. Like, d- does it matter at all? Or should everyone should just play their part in the machine? I mean, have you have you seen Cell, the movie Cell? Um, the... the uh, the the one where they're trapped in that fucking maze of the Vincent D'Onofrio one. No, no, wait, maybe it's not Cell. Uh, Cube, Cube. Oh no, I have not seen Cube. No. Okay, but but the, one of the points in Cube is that no one really knows who built the cube. It's it's this big oh, maze. Yeah. It's this big maze of rooms, and every room's got like a death trap in it and shit. Right, and right. people are just put, put put in it, and they they kind of figure out that at the end that there's no point to it. It's just like this military industrial complex thing that was constantly funded by different groups and got out of control to the point where there's no single person behind it anymore. It's just there because the system put it in place. It's just kind of a kind of a byproduct of the system, really. Well, if you've been following the uh, current events in America for the last three weeks, then you certainly don't get any sense of, like, there's absolutely no rhyme or reason <laughs> to mm. um, the highest levels of American yeah. society. <laughs> I mean, it's not like there are, like, nuclear weapons involved in this at all you know so no, no. everything's basically fine everything's we're, good. We're, we're good yeah we're good yeah i i really like this i'm definitely going to be revisiting this i'm probably going to buy this one is there is there a nice uh dvd release that i should be paying yes, attention there is, to? sir Let's see, see how here. i segued i segued yeah. right into it very yeah. smooth very smooth uh you can get yourself a nice blue underground region zero dvd there is no blu-ray but uh the blue underground dvd is out there and uh it's very much worth picking up the, Does it come in a like special edition with a pair of bright yellow socks? No, I wish it did come with bright yellow socks that that actress wore. That would be even <laughs> more kinky and awesome. But it does have some good stuff on it. It does have a, a an interview from Fabio Testi talking about working with Oliver Reed, who was drunk for most of his time on the set. <laughs> so I read. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this was something common. I think. With I Reed. think uh, What's his? Sosama says, uh, you know, yeah, after the 26th or 27th bottle of wine, you know, um, Reed got yeah. a little, Reed got a little, got a little difficult to work with. You know? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Salima said um, Reed was good to work with until about two or three in the afternoon because then his alcoholism would become difficult to work with. Testy said that he was often uh, challenged by Reed for for drinking games on set. Reed caused so much shit and started so he he was kind of like Klaus Kinski, like a drunken Klaus Kinski. Yeah. Like instead of insane, he was just drunk all the time. Right. He started so much shit with the crew members that the crew members were told. This day would be the final day of shooting with Oliver Reed, and that day was a false day. Like he he finished before that, a few days before that. That way he could get out of there, and they wouldn't settle any scores with him after the production was over. <laughs> oh That's God. how bad it was. I, I I believe it. I believe it. I mean, yeah. it, and it really does go to speak for the idea that you know there are amazing films that had a terrible behind the scenes and then there are terrible films that had an amazing behind the scenes you know kind of kind of experience and it really doesn't track at all i hate it for those crew members because you know you, you hate you hate to hear that you know because yeah. but it's a phenomenal performance and it's kind of like well how do you you know what do you say to that you know yeah well i mean testy and salim at least are pretty nonchalant about it though like they both say, you know, it, it was difficult, but we loved it at the same time. It was the common crew members who got shit upon it. Right, I mean, and, that's, and that's always, the, I mean, you know, yeah. hey, this doesn't have thematic re- re- relevance to the film that we're discussing at all, <laughs> where <laughs> big name people kind of do what the fuck they want, and then, like, who gets to suffer for it? They're the rank and file at the bottom, you know? Yeah. The script girl got kidnapped halfway through the film <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> Because Oliver Reed needed another bottle of Jack Daniels, you know. No. Yeah, and uh, a neat, a neat little uh, bit of trivia for this one that sort of plays out on screen um, it says, in one scene, Oliver Reed was supposed to unlock Fabio Testi's handcuffs and drag him out of the car, but Oliver couldn't get the small keys to fit in the cuffs. So after three takes, he got frustrated and threw the keys, which happened to fall in a sewer drain. Fabio was left in handcuffs for two hours before me- more keys could be located. So that's why his character is in handcuffs for half the fucking film before they finally got him out. Because that's where that's those that's where those scenes slotted into the film. So <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yeah, a great uh, again the the uh, Morricone un amici, which mm-hmm. you'll be listening to shortly. Great uh, piece of music, and um, again, uh, very similar score. I mean, I- I'm glad that yeah. you did actually sit down and compare them. I think possibly, I mean, Revolver is probably the even better kind of use of it. I think that it um, fits the mood of the um, right. of this kind it's, of slightly darker, more elemental piece than the, the a little bit more kind of fun and games. Uh, yeah, well, it's got the French. It's it's got the French Alps thing, which is all fun and games. Which is like, God, I should be seeing some uh, Swedish actress fuck some dude in a, in a in a Euro film for that. But it's cool. Six like, series, Lee. Come on, we got to save for that. We'll find some stuff. The actual score is interesting. Like the album for it is interesting because there's one track on that that's about 13 minutes long. Sort of the main uh, melody of the theme, you know, the more hard pressing theme, not the on Amaki or whatever, which is done in different ways that sort of cuts as one whole track. And that has been cut up throughout the film to uh, serve different moods and different themes in the actual film so it, it sort of changes tone and pitch and stuff like that for different it, it seems like that's and, and this, this is kind of speculation on my part but it seems like that's a lot of the way that these sorts of scores are used like uh, the grand duel is kind of my my favorite my, my go-to yeah. example for this right now because they just reuse that same piece of music like over and over again mm-hmm. in uh, Django they reuse that kind of Bakalov um, the, the, the chorus I think is the one that they and they reuse that one a few times during yeah. the course of the film and so it feels like you know they're I mean basically I suspect that a lot of the a lot of the way the scoring worked was they just kind of gave him like a general like concept and said go yeah, and then we're kind of just essentially wrote a score, and then they just sort of edited to that. You know, when a film like this works well, I mean, it's just sort of like, well, they managed to kind of cut to a, a kind of a maybe not even pre-existing, but they made you know, it's it's sort of like they're working within this thing, and they just kind of cut where they need to and and make it work. Sometimes these films just seem to be a little bit off, and it does kind of feel like, well, you know, they. They just couldn't quite. They didn't quite have the time and yeah. resources to like make that work as well as it could have. But and I will, I will say, uh, just for the budget, it was eighty million um, lira, and it brought back at least in lira four hundred and seventy-seven point three seven four million 
So that was a pretty big return for this motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I mean that's a, I mean it's it's a hit. Like this is, yeah. this is a hit film. I mean, which uh, again, like that's that's great. I mean, you know, this is this is uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think we might be like talking it up a little bit, a little bit much, you know, and, mm-hmm. and kind of like tells. It, it does. Uh, it does have some issues with with. Uh, it does drag just a little bit here and there, and it's a little bit, bit, a little bit easy to kind of drift off during some of the uh, the plot sequences. And I think we've both kind of said, like, I still don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly how the pop singer like plays into it, except like, yeah, you know, like Mary Gibbs is kind of the. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> <laughs> Italian Euro trash Barry Gibbs. In case Although it is it, a it, more annoying version of Barry Gibbs. That's it, yeah. Although it is neat that his character, they actually implement the actual uh, in Amici into his character where he's actually doing a version of that oh! song, one of his hit songs. It's yeah, kind of fun. Even, um, it's fun. Or, or there's even a, a credit at the beginning where it's an Amici as by whoever it was. Yeah. So that so I mean I guess the guy got residuals for it. It may not be that actor, but somebody got residuals for it. Hopefully, oh, he, pro- he probably did just for performing it on screen. I think yeah, or yeah, something like so. that. But hey. so you gotta you gotta appreciate that. Um, yeah. Always always but, nice. But uh, yeah, I guess we got pretty two good goddamn Italian films from Salima to uh, for people to check out. Uh, I think we like them both and uh, Re- revolvers, definitely the more meaty one. Uh, if you, if you really want to sit down and, uh, and just dig through a film and get all the good stuff. But uh, I think, I think violent city, I would say like, that's the, if you're a Bronson fan, that's sort mm-hmm. of the, the, the way to, to, way to, the way to approach that. And uh, honestly, if you don't care about like understanding what's going on through through big chunks of the film, or even if you just want to watch the big action sequence at the beginning, uh, it's worth putting on just for that ten minutes. And just yes. kind of, I may very well do that. I may very well put that movie on just for that opening ten minutes. Well, yeah. you get you get two just really cool things because you get the chase scene, and then right. before that, you get the the credit sequence with the great score behind it. And you mm-hmm. get that really stylized. Someone's taking pictures of Bronson and his girlfriend. It's, it's, it's got a little bit of that James Bondy kind of, yes. um, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, I mean, this is kind of the, the peak of the spy mm-hmm. sort, of, sort of genre. So the, there is, or it's a little bit after that, but it's, it's the rip off of the like spy yeah. genre. It's the, um, but they are, they are kind of playing with that same kind of iconography, that same kind of theme. And, uh, I think the whole idea of him being like this, this like master sniper, you know, who like kills people from afar. That that feels like a, a little bit of a spy movie thing, more so than a crime movie thing. I, yeah. I wish there was a, a, you know, rewriting it. Like like there there is kind of the case to be made for remaking something like that, where it's like there's a really good kind of core to this, and I like certain elements of it. But you could definitely see a remake of this, and uh, you know, if I were if I were gonna like give one note, it would definitely be like he needs to he needs to be like close up. That's that's who this guy needs to be, you know. He needs to be like killing people with a silence, you know. Like, well, they something. they kind of did that because when you think about it, Violent City is this kind of precursor to The Mechanic, which was also a Bronson film, mm-hmm. and they actually, of course, remade that with Jason Statham, mm-hmm. and they did a sequel t- as well, which sucks ass, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I but, haven't seen any of them, so you know. Put them and on the the, re- the remake is terrible. The remake of the mechanic isn't terrible. It's not great, but well, it's all right. Jason Statham is just like like um, <laughs> I have I have a uh, th- Jason Statham I first saw in uh, Snatch, and right. so I always think of him as that guy. And then the transporter, like uh, I guess two years later, a year later, two years later, and you go, oh, holy shit, this guy's like action star, you know? Yeah. And, um, and it just never really petered out for him because. It, those that, movies, those movies don't play. They did. They don't play in big theaters like they used to in the eighties. That's the biggest problem. Right. Well, I I actually saw the transporter theatrically, and I I mean I was just like, man, this is this is a super fun movie. God, we got yeah. the transporter now. Yeah, I, I actually uh, legitimately love that movie. The sequel is shit, but like <laughs> the first one is is great. Uh, what is it? Part three where he's like protecting that uh, really hot Russian redheaded chick. I I stopped after two. Like oh. I was, you know, I saw I saw the first sequel and went, all right, that's 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 it. You know, yeah. like it, it went from lots of kind of cool martial arts, kind of like more a little bit of a Jackie Chan kind of approach right. to, to you know, um, without quite as much comedy, with a little bit more of this sort of like improvised sort of stuff. And then when it became, I'm gonna like flip a car to like rip a bomb off the bottom of my vehicle from a crane. So yeah, I don't know. You've either got to go the full crank 
and just mm-hmm. turn that up to eleven, or that's just ridiculous. And it just it just didn't feel like the same universe to me, and I'm I just kind of lost interest. I'm like, yeah. hey, this is just dumb. Statham's so good though; he's legit. If his career was in the seventies, he would be a big name that everyone talks about now. Like he 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 is right. that good. Like he he's that kind of old style tough guy uh, male actor that you saw like Bronson, like Lee Marvin. Uh, mm-hmm. People like that, you know, before the big muscle bound freaks like Schwarzenegger and the Stallone like took over the 80s or whatever. Sure. And now that era is just kind of gone now where action movies don't command the same respect and same weight they do in theaters like they used to. So right, right. Yeah, it's kind of gone. But uh, and it's sad because Statham's really good and he should be in better well, stuff. It's it's the it's the sort of thing where, you know. You got to think the transporter is from 2000. Why are we talking about this now? Um, mm. The transporter is from 2002, right? And that's the same year that like uh, Spider Man, you know, the yeah. Tobey Maguire Spider Man happened, and that's like the not the first, but that's we're gonna make a billion dollars on like CGI Spider Man. Yeah, element. It's like he's too late to have been like the 80s or 90s action. He's too late mm-hmm. to be Stallone, but he's too early to have been like in. Um, the uh, the Fast Five, the, the Fast and Furious movie. Although he's going to be in the next one. Oh, he's going to be in the next. Well, yeah. he was too he was too early to kind of like be on that train. When Everybody's in the next one, by the way. Kurt Russell is in the next one. I, I I have I have I have I have I have completely avoided that entire Same. series. Same here. But I've I've heard that like the first one is okay, the second and. Well, the second one sucks balls, and then they get interesting with the third, and then once you get to like the fifth, they actually get like really fun. You know, you know what? I, you know what I hate about that series? That series gives fucking Vin Diesel carte blanche to make shitty side movies that aren't Guardians of the Galaxy. He just made that triple X sequel, which apparently is the worst thing ever put on celluloid. Well, well who, not even celluloid at this point, but you know what I meant. I'm 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 just I've just completely avoided. Um, seeing anything anymore yeah so, you're you're a smart man you're a smart man yeah, i just i just i, I, I just punish kinda, myself you know there, there is that there is that temptation to kind of do the popcorn action thing and just kind of mm-hmm. go and like, i don't know like for me when i see that kind of shit now it's just like i don't even like i'll put it on one day it's fine you know yeah. like uh, but up until april 3rd i have a theater where i can go and drink so yeah, that that always that makes any kind of shitty movie better, you know. Like <laughs> I saw Suicide Squad. You know, the only thing, God, we should talk about Suicide Squad one day. I was thinking about the other day, like Margot Robbie is the only thing I give a shit about in Suicide Squad. She's mm-hmm. great. The entire rest of the film, it's not terrible. It's just, eh, who cares? Yeah, you know. And that's that's it for me. And that's kind of how I feel about almost any like big budget movie these days. Yeah. You know, I miss the era of the like forty million dollar like fun action movie. Right. You know, like that era when you could do something that had some money enough money behind it to where you could do a kind of cool some cool action sequences, you could kind of put some characters on, you can kind of do some cool stuff, but then it didn't have to be like and then we're gonna blow up the world at the end. You, know? yeah, you, you, had, you, you actually know? had to you actually had to restrain yourself and do cool things to cut corners and make things interesting. When you actually right. had a budget that small restricting you from doing bullshit. Like imagine if they could make like a really cool forty million dollar Batman film where they didn't go. I would super love to big. see that. Yeah. Imagine imagine like a Batman film where he's a detective. Imagine yeah. imagine a, a sort of neo noir Batman film. And you can yeah. do that except it all has to. It has to be two hundred million dollars. You know, mm. it can't be. Let's get an interesting actor and let's basically do. Although Gotham, um, Gotham is apparently pretty good. Well, and that's and that's uh, the flip side of that is like the really the place where all this interesting stuff is happening is not in the movies nowadays because mm. the movie it, the film industry is all about spectacle and they've lost character and that's kind of yeah. coming back. Hell on Wheels, you say you say it's great. I'm going to try to yep. check that out. There's a ton of great character work. There's a ton of great like thematic work. There's a ton of like medium budget, small budget, decent. You know, looks decent, but is it all over the place? But it's all on TV these days. Yeah, you know, and you kind of have to hunt for it. And um, but yeah, I mean, then again, you think about what's the really good comic book stuff? Like it's Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. Yes, like that's the really good stuff. Don't don't give me. Although I did like. Um, the first Daredevil. two Captain America films I liked. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, first one I could do without, but the second one's super fucking awesome. Because that's a 70s spy or political right, thriller. Yeah. 
Right, right. I mean, I I think I have a more of a fondness for the first one. I just I, I kind of like the first one, even though I know it's like legitimately not all that great. But like, uh, are... all all it is is all it is is the Red Skull. It takes me right out of it. It's oh just well, a little too goofy, a little too goofy for everything else see, that's presented. For, for me, it's like the the training sequences and like Chris Evans kind of grounds that, and then you get um, oh, he's so good at it. Like he's yeah. really good. <laughs> Did you see what happened on Twitter with Chris Evans today? No, what did he do? Chris Evans got in a Twitter war with David fucking Duke. Really? That's right. <laughs> Captain America is punching Nazis on Twitter. <laughs> only, only in this day and age would that happen. God damn. And that is, and that is 2017. In yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, I do have a lot of respect for Captain America. He is the one American hero I can get behind. But uh, <laughs> uh, but I, th- I think we've I think we've uh, gone on a little. Too we've long we've gone this. we've gone far afield. Two great Italian crime films. Check them. In particular, Revolver. If you're going to watch one, watch Revolver. Yeah. But um, they're they're both they're both definitely worth checking out. Yeah. That's all. That's all I got. Yeah. So Do Daniel, it. tell people where they can, can find you on the interwebs. At this point. Follow me. Just go on Twitter. I'm at Daniel Lee Harper. I do stuff, but I haven't done a lot of stuff lately, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. I'm kind of reconnoitering exactly what we're doing, but I do have a, some other podcasts that I'm trying to get production back into, but I just have had a hard time getting like momentum on, on doing that stuff. Oh, I will plug another thing that I'm doing, uh, okay. Wrong With Authority, which is another movie podcast I'm on. I do that with uh, some Doctor Who friends, some British Doctor Who friends of mine. Uh, with Jack and James and Kit, who have all been on this podcast. Yep. And we talk about movies from history and the real history and sort of like through sort of a political lens. And we mostly do that sober, which I know will come as a shock to fans of this show who are used to me being slightly tired and slightly drunk most of the time. (laughs) Um, We did an episode with uh, A Beautiful Mind and The Imitation Game. Right, which uh, were two movies I paid because we rotate hosting duties on that. That was a fun episode. And there's an extended uh, riff in the middle about gold pens, which is um, really worth the, the whole <laughs> listen, as far as I'm concerned. That was, that was so much fun. So See, I've, I, I've, I've yet to listen to that one, but I'm pretty sure it's probably just as good as the Jack the Ripper one you guys did first. The Jack the Ripper one, I, I, I mean, it's, it's just, it's so much fun just sitting and bullshitting with those guys. And then we had like a, a sort of pro episode on Jack Shabcast where we did JFK and Nixon. So, oh yeah. The, you know, so, and then the, that's really where we figured out, oh, this is something we want to keep doing. And then we just found a concept around that. But yeah, a uh, beautiful mind. Um, that movie is fucking terrible. Like that is <laughs> fucking awful. Please, nobody should ever watch that film again unless you just want. to like wallow in the most saccharine bits of like two, like early two thousands Oscar bait bullshit like that ever existed. Uh, can God. you just mute it and watch Jennifer Connelly? No, I mean she. I mean she's great. I mean Jennifer Connelly is great. I love Jennifer Connelly. She's wasted in the film. She's completely wasted in the film, and she's gorgeous, of course. But if you just want to, I mean, go watch Dark City or Requiem for a Dream. Requiem for yeah. a Dream is streaming on Netflix right now. Go watch it. That's a way better film with Jennifer Connelly, and you can see her vagina. I, and I, I, hate to, <laughs> I hate to leave it. You you went there. I'm going to go even further. She goes ass to ass in the film, yeah. you know, and but and not ass to mouth, that, and that's important. And you get a creepy guy going ass to ass. So, you know, <laughs> check out Requiem for a Dream. It's got Sean Wayans in it, and he's not terrible. Or Mar- is it Sean or Marlon? It's Marlon. Marlon Wayans, I think. It's got Marlon Wayans in it, and he's good. Which is the biggest revelation from that film. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what the- Released that film uh, because that was that that film was released in in two thousand. So like when they were filming it, uh, mm-hmm. one was brand new. On the DVD release, there's like a like a uh, little behind the scenes bit of Marlon Wayans doing Jar Jar Binks, and it's uh, oh my god, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, and of course you can find us at tmbdos.podbean.com. There you can find our links to iTunes, YouTube, and Facebook. Join our Facebook group. That's the best place to get in touch with us, to request films, to tell us how shit we are, how great we are, and to just, you know, engage us in general nonsensical banter. I mean, I just put up a post there 
tonight asking for people's recollections of what they used to watch on A&E back in the 90s, back in the golden days when they were still a good channel, because that's something I'm interested in because I'm thinking about writing a little piece on how A&E informed sort of movie watching and loving movies and horror movies and things like that, because it was a kind of a big influential sort of mover in my, in my life back then when I was younger. So uh, I, I need people to jog my memory. So uh, go, yeah. go check, go check that out. Yeah. Check us out on Facebook, CB falls. Tell us what you used to watch on A&E in your yeah. comment this week. <laughs> Can't wait for that. And if, of course, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, uh, give us a five-star rating, give us a review. If you give us a review and you're outside of Canada, please tell me so I can switch the region on iTunes and see your review, and we'll read it on the show, and uh, we'll thank you for it, whether even if it's a negative review. I don't give a fuck. I'll still read it. Give, give us five stars and then rip us a new asshole. Yes. That's what, you know, yes. That's what we want. Because I would love to read that shit. Yeah. And if you see another review on the iTunes uh, page for us, Please click that it was uh, a helpful review. Yes, this this review is helpful. Apparently that helps as well for all this bullshit. So, <laughs> and of course, you know, blueapron.com, audible.com. <laughs> Mailchimp, uh, it's it's the best way to uh, reach your business customers with yeah, uh, really targeted uh, business. Share, you know share your your business. business. Mailchimp just helps you. Yeah, Dude, Sherry's yeah. Berries and um, uh, all that other good Squarespace. Yeah, Squarespace. 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 I, I, I don't think people use Squarespace as much anymore. That was a big one for a couple of years, but uh, now it's all Sherry's Berries and Blue Apron. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, if you, uh, I'm not going to begrudge you for using those things, but don't go there from our suggestion. That's all. Although Except you could for Audible. Say- Audible, Audible is actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I appreciate the Audible format. If you're an audiobook listener. It's um, it's a, it's actually a really good service. I, I, we don't get paid for that. I actually just like Audible. Like, I would feel bad about like advertising for them just because I legitimately, you know, yeah, like think it's, it was pretty good, you know. But uh, yeah, I guess we're done. Uh, we're not sure what we're doing yet next week. Daniel and I will probably figure this out after we go uh, off the air. But thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Daniel, for joining me, and uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Can't wait. Yeah.
Thank you for listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Site. For past episodes, links to the host's other stuff, and links to various podcasts and websites of similar interest, please visit us at tmbdos.podbean.com. There you can also find our iTunes, YouTube, and Facebook links. Please join our Facebook group, as this is the best way to get in contact with us and to keep up to date with what's coming up on the podcast. We also can be found as part of the Oi Spaceman family of podcasts at oispaceman.com, where you can find various sci-fi themed podcasts about Doctor Who, Red Dwarf, Firefly, and classic sci-fi novels. If you decide to subscribe to us through iTunes, please take a moment to leave us a star rating and a review. Thank you. Drive through. <laughs>